All right, guys, now we're going to take a look at Jackson's second term, and right away, there's already a problem. Jackson lived for conflict, claiming, I was born for the storm. Calm does not suit me. He didn't have to look far for his next battle, the National Bank of the United States. It was not a public bank. It was a private bank. It was publicly chartered, and it managed the affairs of the federal government, but it was privately owned. Andrew Jackson considered the bank to be unconstitutional anyway. He had a genius for picking his enemies. The Bank of the United States was put on this planet to serve Jackson as a foil for all of the aristocrats, the moneyed interests, the corrupt forces against whom he, the representative of honest, hardworking Americans, particularly Westerners, were opposed to. Jackson's vice president. Martin Van Buren came into the White House, and Jackson was lying on a daybed, groaning and moaning. Van Buren ran over to him and said, what is it, Mr. President? What's the matter? And Jackson said, the bank, Mr. Van Buren, the bank is trying to kill me, but I will kill it. The bank came up for recharter in 1832, and President Jackson vetoed the bank. Congress was aghast at Jackson's tactics, seizing power like a street thug. His liberal use of the veto was shocking. In the 19th century, so much less was expected of presidents. And they didn't veto very often. They just sat around largely waiting for Congress to do what Congress was going to do. Altogether, the first six presidents had vetoed 10 bills. In Jackson's eight years in office, he vetoed 12. So Jackson doesn't like this second bank of the U.S. It's supported by the wealthy businessmen, and the average Americans who had voted for Jackson disliked it because they thought it favored the rich, limited the amount of money that the state banks could lend where they kept most of theirs. He also hated the president of the bank, Nicholas Biddle, who was doing favors for wealthy politicians and was very much in this camp of let's uh, not be supportive of Andrew Jackson and any of his policies. And Biddle finds a friend in Henry Clay, and they get a proposal through Congress to recharter the bank four years ahead of schedule. And it gets to Jackson's desk. Jackson does what they expect him to do, which is veto it, and they figure, hey, this will lose him the election. Well, it turns out that he actually, they reelected him, showed that the power of the president could influence voters in a great way. Also, Jackson is dealing with a outcome of this high tariff that had been passed in 1828, which had angered Southerners over the high prices on manufactured goods. They warned, they wondered if Congress could pass these unjust tariffs, could they also try to end slavery? And so Jackson finds that he is opposing his own vice president, uh, John C. Calhoun from South Carolina, who had always been on this side of nullification for the longest time. And his argument was that the states could nullify the tariff because the Constitution was an agreement of the states not the people. And therefore, if the states disagreed with something that they were doing, the states were within their right to simply um, avoid the law or simply not enforce it. Daniel Webster argued against it, saying it was created by the people, not the states. And Calhoun believed that the states' rights were more important than keeping the union together. And so in 1832, Congress passed this new tariff. And South Carolina voted to nullify the, the tariff and warned that if they were forced to impose them, they would secede from the union. And Jackson warned them that this, the, that secession was treason, that if he had to, he'd hang his own vice president, John C. Calhoun, over it. In 1833, Congress allowed Jackson to use force if needed, and they passed a lower tariff. South Carolina couldn't get support for nullification, and uh, its ideas evaporated, even though uh, Calhoun himself had resigned. So in 1836, Jackson retires from public life, and he supports his vice president, Martin Van Buren, for president. Um, Van Buren wins pretty easily over the three Whig Party candidates. The Whig Party is the new party of basically the I hate Jackson party. But Britain's buying less cotton, banks couldn't collect on loans, and that's caused a lot of banks to fail, and the whole U.S. economy collapsed in this panic of 1837, right as soon as Van Buren takes office. Van Buren stumbles into the great economic financial disaster of 1837 which was pretty much the equivalent of the 2009 bust in the United States. And it was terrifying to people, and the banks were failing. 
the credit system of the country uh, collapses. And so we're in a terrible recession, which really lasts for years. What became known as the Panic of 1837 shut down 90% of factories on the East Coast. In New York, at least 50,000 were unemployed, more than 15% of the city's population. New York City was the great engine of the American economy. And with hundreds of thousands of people either out of work or, or underemployed, that took a lot of the wind out of Van Buren's sails. He looked like a weak, emasculated president. The collapse happened within two months of Van Buren taking office. The president called an emergency session of Congress, the first that didn't involve a military crisis. He tried to put federal deposits of money into public places, but that wasn't tremendously effective. He doesn't have a Congress that will allow him to pass this legislation. So Van Buren spends most of his time trying to create a solution which never is given a, a chance to work and uh, probably wouldn't have worked anyway. So Van Buren's entire hopes of a legacy as president are sunk by the man who had even nominated him, which was Andrew Jackson. So he faces a challenge from this great general, a very Jacksonian type in William Henry Harrison in the election of 1840. Um, Harrison wins because he's this man of the people, but unfortunately Harrison doesn't last long. But Harrison was old. At 68, he was the oldest man to serve as president until Ronald Reagan was elected at 69. At a time when modern wonders like Samuel Morse's telegraph were melting distances, the man Democrats nicknamed Old Granny seemed hopelessly out of date. Anxious to prove his vitality, Harrison made a fateful decision. It was a freezing day in Washington, and he insisted on delivering his 8,000-word inaugural address, which was the longest uh, that had ever been written up to that time. He delivered it outdoors without an overcoat or a hat and contracted a pretty bad cold, which developed into pleurisy or pneumonia. That was the end of William Henry Harrison. Only 32 days after taking the oath as the ninth president, Harrison became the first to die in office. So John Tyler becomes the first to succeed to the office of president. Thanks, guys, for paying attention. Hopefully you took good notes.